Thanks for listening to Exploring the Wine Glass podcast, the podcast for people who love wine. I'm Lori Budd, a UC Davis winemaking program and WSET Level 2 graduate. You can find Exploring the Wine Glass on all the socials as well as your favorite podcast catchers. If you haven't subscribed yet, now's the perfect time. I promise I'll never tell you what to drink, but I'll always share what's in my glass. Well, you know, man cannot live on wine alone, no matter how much we try. But in all seriousness, as a winemaker, we admittedly drink a lot of wine. But sometimes our palate just craves something, you know, a little different. When that happens, we turn to beer and usually an IPA. I can be found on Untapped as Low Dolphin. If you are on that app, give me a follow and you'll see exactly how much IPA I drink. While we have been in confinement, virtual has taken on a whole new meaning. I have sat down and virtually clinked with many friends, and although it doesn't replace the in-real-life experience, it is really nice to at least be able to see the faces. So once again, I'd like to thank Gregory and Vine for putting together another virtual tasting, this one with Jeremy Kosmicki, brewmaster at Founders Brewing. So unscrew, uncork, or saber a bottle, or, you know, open an IPA and listen into the conversation. And if you haven't done so yet, please take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review Exploring the Wine Glass. Slancha. I'd like to welcome Jeremy Kaznicki, um, brewmaster for Founders Brewing. Um, I give a little bit of background. Founders got started in 1997 with Dave Ingers and at Mike Stevens in Grand Rapids. Um, and Jeremy, you joined in 2000, 2001? 2000, yep. Uh, and then became a head bre- brewer in 2005 and have been making fantastic brews and great you know, creations ever since. So, Jeremy, I'm going to hand it over to you and let you kind of take off with some of the questions that um, we've sent over. Tell us a little bit about founders, about what you're looking at brewing these days, your best pairings, and just have a great virtual happy hour. Sure, sounds great. I'll uh, I'll start with a little bit, but feel free to throw in some questions and keep the conversation hot. And don't forget to drink. So yeah, so it's been a, it's been a wild ride. Um, I joined Founders. Uh, it's actually my first professional brewing um, gig, uh, which is an interesting way to go about it, but um, you know, Founders was pretty small time when I when I started back in 2000. They had a uh, they had a a 30 barrel brew house, which is fairly sizable. They were prepared to be a production brewery, but they were brewing maybe once a week on it, honestly. And and uh, and the kind of beers they made were were what you know what the uh, the experts at the time told them they needed to make beers like amber ale and wheat beer and uh, they had a, a, a Pilsner and a Pale Ale. And, um, you know, that was what craft breweries made back then. Um, but they just weren't, you know, they weren't, they weren't getting any, any sort of attention that they needed. So uh, we started when I joined a couple years later, um, you know, we were, myself and, and Nate Walser, who was the, the brewer that started when, when I became assistant, we had been homebrewing partners together, so we had kind of been working together, had a bunch of, uh, of, of ideas, um, and generally brewed bigger, more flavorful um, beers to kind of entertain our friends um, back in the homebrew days. Uh, so we kind of took that concept there, and Mike and Dave bit on it, and they were like, we want to make these kind of beers and put them in, in package and send them out to the world. This is what we want to be known for. So that's where beers like Dirty Bastard and Breakfast Stout and Red's Rye came from. Um, you know, those were, uh, those were some of the beers that started to get us noticed, get it, get us noticed. Um, and then, uh, you know, get into barrel aging, um, that certainly helped put us on the map. And then, you know, fast forward to, to, you know, 2007, um, 2008, uh, you know, we had kind of gotten, uh, we cut our teeth on these high alcohol, big in your face beers. And, and, and that's the year that we kind of, um, 
did a little bit of a, a, a new thing for us, which was to move into the session beer category. Uh, we were all a little burned out personally, I think, uh, you know, we, we all like drinking beer and, and sometimes you start throughout the day, but you know, when your lowest ABV IPA is 7.2, um, that, that catches up with you pretty quick. So that's, that really, uh, inspired the, the direction to go with all day IPA. And, um, and I suppose that's the beer that really has, uh, provided a lot of the volume growth, at least that we've experienced, um, you know, since then, um, we still continue obviously to make, um, some, some, some really, uh, high end, high ABV special beers, but all day is, is our volume thing. And it's, uh, it's, it's really rounded out our portfolio pretty well. Um, I think you can call it our flagship. Now, a lot of breweries will probably start with a flagship and, and try to make that their thing. We, 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 we got noticed without any flagship, um, and doing, you know, IPA and dirty bastard kind of sharing the load at 20% a piece. Uh, but now with all day over 60% of our production, um, it's kind of changed the, changed the game for us. Um, but it keeps it fun, keeps it interesting. Um, these days I gave up control of, of managing the brewing department, um, the day-to-day activities of it, managing the, the brewers and their schedules and, and all that stuff. I gave that up years ago uh, to a brewing manager. And so now I can focus um, exclusively on uh, recipe development um, and, and, and things like this, hanging out with you guys. So <laughs> that's kind of uh, the, the fast, the fast track history of myself. Um, I'm going to take a second and have a drink. So think of, think of the question. Uh, I've, I'm starting, well, I'm starting. I actually had a, a, a beer already, but I'm on Centennial IPA now. Nice. <laughs> Who else drink at Centennial? Steph? Steph, you're not drinking, are you? <laughs> yeah, in a while, no. Corn apple. <laughs> I don't know why I'm having such difficulties, guys. Um, okay, I'm back. Yes. <laughs> hey, how's it going? I actually, I was in, not sure what I was going to join with with everybody. I was going to either do the Mothership series, the Devil Dancer, but I ended up doing the Civilized um, Brood IPA, which is actually very lovely. Nice. Good. Good. Glad you like that. So, Jeremy, what is your favorite beer that you've made so far? Uh, that's, a, that's a loaded question. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some stuff. I don't know, like a pick a favorite. It depends on what the occasion is. Um, I mean, obviously I, I drink a lot of all day cause that's what I made it for. Uh, but you know, that kind of inspired. There's some other, um, generally my go to is something lighter alcohol with a nice, um, hoppy presence, but some good balance. So, I mean, we've made quite a few beers that fit that fit that mold since then. Uh, I, I drank a lot of the Pilsner, which we just released again. I'm glad to have that back around. Um, I, I usually keep 15 packs in my fridge of all day. Oh, that's uh, nice. Seasonal. And uh, maybe some solid gold, and then I'll have other random things. I have a I have a Four Giants IPA on deck. That's our uh, nice. new um, Imperial IPA that um, we just launched. Um, you know, the, one of those every uh, once in a while seems to do pretty well. <laughs> um, but you know, beers like beers like Breakfast Stout and and the bear, and even the Barrel Age things. Those are those are I I don't go to those as often as as I do other things, but. Um, I suppose if I had to pick a, a favorite beer that uh, that I get to make uh, once a year, drink once a year, that's probably our Harvest Ale. It's our it's our it's our wet hopped beer that, that we make with the fresh uh, fresh off the vine hops in in late August, early September, and that's uh, it's a it's a beer that you can't. Uh, there's only one way to get that flavor, and that's to use those wet hops. And it's a, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of hassle, but it's a beautiful thing. So maybe that's why I like it so much. I love that a brewer that's a hop slut. <laughs> right. That's, that's what we do. <laughs> so, I have a question: What is the ABV on the Imperial? Imperial IPA here? Yeah. Good question. Let me let me look at the label. Nine point two percent. This is reasonable. It's not a you know, it's not double digit. <laughs> it's something nice that you can sit by the pool and just kind of casually drink, which is kind of nice. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yep, doesn't you know? Question. By the time you're done with one, you're uh, you you've had your hop craving, and you probably caught a buzz too. So I have a question for Jeremy. Mm -hmm. 
So I think founders definitely put barrel aged beers on the map. What was the inspiration for pushing the envelope for the different types of um, barrel aged? Well, it's just a, you know, it's, it's innovation is uh, it comes from necessity, and 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 we were we were having so much fun with um, uh, the KBS, which was the first our first barrel aged beer. Uh, Backwoods Bastard came around a little bit by by chance. We just had, um, you know, KBS wasn't a big volume thing. In fact, we 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 actually had some barrels sitting around the brewery that we didn't need KBS, but, but they were getting out. Oh wow! We, we should put something in these things and and at least use them. So we went with uh, some Dirty Bastard, which is a beer we had just normally, and uh, and it turned out great. And that ended up being Backwoods Bastard, which was our our second um, big barrel age. Um, so those, you know, those were the first two. And then after that, it just started getting a little bit weird where we just would pick random things, do, do small volume runs of it. And, uh, you just started to try to think outside the box, you know, try, uh, try every different beer style. Any, there was a, there was a, a time there where every time you'd make a beer, generally high, higher alcohol beers, but take a little bit and fill a couple, fill a couple barrels and see what it's like in a year. You know, that's the that's kind of how you got to stay ahead of that thing. Cause generally, you know, it takes some time before you know if you got anything good on your hands. Um, it was pretty fabulous. That's for sure. It was, it was huge. I remember trying to find a four pack anywhere and yeah. they were absolutely impossible to find because they were so sought after. Mm-hmm. So I thought that's pretty great. Yeah. It's uh it's, it's pretty amazing. I mean, you know, the, when we used to sell before we before we learned how to sell large volumes of beer like KBS out of our tap room, you know we did we had the line around the block uh, of consumers coming to get it. That was always a pretty good feeling. It wasn't it wasn't very uh, um, feasible to to maintain, um, but it was a cool thing to to experience for sure. So I have a question. Do you ever do um, long 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 time ago we went to Sam Adams and they brought us in after their very short tour. They brought us into a back room and then they let us taste like five different beers. And they said to us that we were there sampling um, to decide what they were going to release. Do you do things like that um, to decide what you're actually going to release versus what you think? Well, I'll just keep for myself. Well, we've done a few um, uh, more formalized uh, survey type things with uh, some of our enthusiasts. Um but you know the, uh, the the coolest thing about our place, or one of the coolest things at least, is uh, we have a huge tasting room, huge tap room, 750 people capacity, and we get a lot of people coming through there. So we get a lot of feedback, and that's really that's my testing ground for for new ideas. Um, and you can you know you can tell it's it's right there. You make a beer, you put it on tap. People love it. People are meh. You can really track that based on first of all how fast you go through the batch. Um, and, and then just being there, being able to walk out and talk to people about these things, you, know, you can kind of get a good idea from there. What's, uh, if you got a hit on your hands or if it's back to the drawing board. So I use that, I use that all the time. That's, that's all our R and D beer gets, gets poured through there. Um, and it's, it's, it's not only, um, um, just projects that we're working on, but you know, people come to our tap room and they expect to, to find these, these beers that they can't get on the shelf back home. So we really, because it's become a destination spot, we have to keep, you know, the, the 30, 40 taps that we have full of uh, not only our, our, our core brands and, and whatever the current seasonal or specialty beers, but all these different one-offs that we make just in our tap rooms. Oh, awesome. Yay. Good job, Helen. <laughs> so, Jeremy, I have a question for you, another question for you. Shoot. How do you feel about being voted the most admired brewer in readers? Uh, by, by readers of Spirit Magazine in 2019. That that was that was pretty cool. Do you work for yeah. Spirit? Do you work for Spirit Magazine? No, I just, oh, you just saw I did that? my research. <laughs> Fabulous. No, that was a that was a pretty cool thing. I mean, I don't I don't put a whole lot of stock in awards, but I suppose if I was going to win one, most admired brewers seems seems pretty pretty cool. <laughs> um, you know, I'm just I don't know I. I if you guys knew where I where I came from, uh, a home brewer uh, with no experience, um, to be given the keys to a, a, a car uh, like Founders, and then to to see the the growth and 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 um, all the all the cool things that have happened, uh, it's just pretty humbling. And you know, 
I'm, I'm doing the best I can. Founders done a great job to surround me with really, really brilliant people um, and let me focus on what I do best, which is, I think, you know, use my, my palette and, and creativity and help them do new things. But, you know, it's taken so many uh, really hardworking, brilliant people to build this into what it is today. And uh, it's, it's, it's a great, great, great feeling to be a part of that and, um, you know, just do my part as best I can. Yeah. Doing great job. Thanks. So how did you transition from the uh, home brewing to the, the professional brewing? That was, uh, yeah, that's, it's pretty different. I wasn't even a very advanced home brewer, so there was a lot of learning to do on, on, the, on the fly. Um, you know, fortunately, uh, I had some good teacher. Um, Nate, who I, I was brewing with, actually had been assistant brewer at a, a neighboring brewery in Holland who happened to have exactly the exact same brew system that we had. So that made that transition um, really easy. But, you know, I, I learned on our system and, um, and and knowing that Founders is my only brewing gig and that's the only brew house I really ever worked on, you know, I um, – I, I know how that works I, to go to another brewery and run somebody else's stuff. I just, I don't have that kind of experience where I've seen all these different things. Um, you know, I you probably figure something out, but uh, when we, when we grew our brewery to, you know, from that original 30 barrel brew house and then designed an 80 barrel brew house, and then we designed a 300 barrel brew house, all we really did was try to keep our process the same Um as it is on the small system because everybody loves the way that beer tastes and we didn't want to spend a bunch of time having to go through and, and, um, you know, change parameters because, because of a change in a process. So we really tried to keep everything the same throughout the system. Uh, it's not our biggest beer house is not the most efficient thing that you could have at that size, but you know, from the first batch of beer we made on it, it was tasting perfect. And, um, that was a big, uh, a big, um, goal of ours. Uh-oh, what happened, Amanda? <laughs> wasp in the house. <laughs> there is a wasp in my house because I've had to go. Oh, no. <laughs> Jeremy, I have a question about the uh, masagave. Ooh. Oh, I love that. It's oh, super salty. Does that come from the barrel? And in terms of the barrel age program, like how many barrels per year are part of that program? And how did you come up with masagave? <laughs> well, let me talk about masagave real quick. It's uh, there is actually sea salt added to that beer. Um, it's based on a style uh, called the goza, which is a tart and salty um, ale. Uh, I kind of took that concept and um, and uh, imperialized it, I suppose, just made it higher alcohol percentage so that it could um, just generally hold up better in the in the barrel. And then lined up some tequila barrels, um, added some lime to it, and was trying to kind of recreate a, a margarita type drink. Um, yeah, I definitely taste the lime and definitely get the margarita vibes. It's really cool. Yeah, lime and salty. Um, little little tip for you: uh, um, how I prefer to enjoy my masagaves, and you'll probably never hear another brewer tell you to do this, but I've been actually pouring it over some ice. Um, kind of takes the edge off the, uh, uh, the CO2 and it keeps it cold and dilutes it a little bit. So it's not like, it's just, it's a little more crushable, but like I said, you, a brewer will never tell you to pour his beer over ice, but I'm saying yeah. that. <laughs> it, it was prosecuted and done very, very well. And that is, I think, very, very hard to accomplish trying to make the margarita of beers and it came out. It was just fabulous. I was actually really sad that I couldn't find it anywhere else. <laughs> Well, uh, uh, we're about to release it again, so it should be around very good in the summer. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Um, I think you asked how many barrels we have. I think com I think combined with all of our projects, now it, it, it ebbs and flows because we fill, we empty. It depends what time of year it is. But I think we generally have about 20,000 um, different units, um, yeah. mostly bourbon barrels. But we got a lot of tequila now with this masagave and some other weird offshoots. I got a bunch of brandy barrels I just filled up with some weird stuff and, and we've done some rum barrel things. So, um, you know, bourbon is the most, it's the most available. Um, they're generally in the best shape, uh, because they only get used uh, one time by the, that's, that's the law of bourbon. Um, so they got to get rid of them when they're done with it, whatever it's been. Whereas with a tequila rum barrel, sometimes they'll just keep real refilling those things until they hardly hold liquid anymore. And then, you know, that's why you gotta be careful when you're out buying, 
uh, those things resale because um, you might get some barrels in pretty bad shape. But bourbons, you can always count on. So speaking of a summer beer, what are some of the beer profiles that are in the works that we can be looking, that we can look forward to this um, summer? From Bounders? Yeah. Oh, man. Can I talk about that stuff? I don't know. Can you? <laughs> I think we'd all love to hear about it if you could. Anything, anything with grapefruit? I'm just wondering. Well, some fun <laughs> things. Um, we, can, we can definitely join Founders Cadre and always keep up and find out really fast in uh, the future and know before other people. That's true. Um, Cadre does find out before others. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what I'm supposed to talk about anymore. I, I, there was a rule that if, if I haven't read it on Facebook yet, I can't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> There's some fun stuff. I mean, obviously, these are weird times right now, and it's um, yeah. we did have some releases that are like, <sighs> you want to release a, a new beer right now in, in this in this environment? It's yeah, it's pretty bit, tough. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what we're gonna do about some of these things. I think that you know, obviously, we're gonna keep coming out with beer. We're 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 in a pretty fortunate position um, to uh, in the fact that we, we don't rely on draft as much as a lot of other breweries do. Um, in fact, our, m most of our volume is in the, in the, in the 15 packs uh, mm -hmm. variety. So it's, you know, that's still, those sales are actually up. Everybody's shifted from drinking on premise to, to going to the store and buying um, um, something, maybe more value too. So I, you know, obviously all day Centennial 15 packs are they're the best value in the country, if you ask me. Um, and, and they're doing well. Um, but, you know, coming out with a new release right now, it's not going to get the kind of uh, support we would normally give it. So I think we're just trying to take things as they come and, you know, we'll, we'll still got some new beers that we've committed to come out, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see. Well, hey, hey, uh, Jeremy, what's the deal with the uh, with the uh, CBS? I know you said you 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 were thinking about not doing that. Is that, is that was was that just pub to get oh, the word out, or are you gonna come out with it again sometime soon, please? CBS? Yeah, no, man. No, told me told me I can't make it anymore. Oh, <laughs> uh, my I don't school. That's, that's the word. We're we're we're, we're taking a break at least. Uh, you know, Dave Dave likes to say never say never. Mike says nope, we're not brewing it. So I don't know. We'll see what happens. I, I we're not going to make it again for a while. We're going to get that was one of the best uh, press packs that uh, we got for a seasonal release. So uh, kudos to your PR firm. And uh, you know, it was it's almost like this coffin like you know experience opening that pack this Wasn't year it was, fabulous? it was it was really fabulous it, but those of us kind of get yeah we gathered around the package you know we were like oh my god this is the last re last release you know of uh of this wow <laughs> uh -huh. well, why did you put it on hold um it, I, there's there's probably a, a, a handful of reasons. I think that we just, in the spirit of people, consumers just love new stuff so much that we're gonna try to, um, you know, do do a beer for a couple of years and and then let it ride for a while and let that uh, let that anticipation build back up um, and bring out some new stuff that is exciting. I, it's the the dynamics of of, of uh, craft beer have changed and and the consumer is not satisfied with the same old same old um how much do you cater to that i mean we do what we can we're not we're not a brewery that's going to come out with weekly releases and, and it, it, we're just not we're, 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 I, I love some same old same old cbs <laughs> I, I i completely agree i completely agree because i mean there's so many trends up to date on different profiles of beer so it's nice to be able to like have your original favorites that you like and be able to know that you know what you're expecting it's going to be there and then just yeah. to enjoy it like you know any other kind of profile i i, I feel the same way and i and i think a lot <laughs> of people do but the really the really vocal people are the are the um the craft beer aficionados that, that yes. demand new stuff all the time. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we'll do what we can. Hey, Jeremy, uh, um, how has the brewing schedule and your overall product planning been influenced by uh, your 90% of Mao owning founders now? Yes, please. Um, 
uh, there hasn't really been any uh, shift in in what was previously our, our plan. Um, they're certainly helping us stay uh, better parking open. spot. <laughs> <laughs> Great one. It's definitely one. Uh, they know they know they know they know how to run a pretty tight ship and. Uh, uh, it's been great. It's been great. They're totally on board with, with all of our, our plans and ideas and they want to help us execute them um, the, uh, the best way that they can be done. So um, it's a really great, really great relationship. Love working with those guys, love their support, um, especially, uh, you know, these, this last month and, um, you know, the, the Spain got hit before us. So they were able to really kind of help us out with some, what was coming and what we were going to have to do. And we've kind of taken a similar approach to, uh, keeping production going, um, you know, they're just they're a, a family operation, and it feels like a family. They really do take care. Of, they care about their employees, and that extends to us at founders. And um, that's just great work with them. Have you guys altered anything uh, production wise during the COVID nineteen crisis? You know, we've just kind of been trying to brew to demand as much as we can. Uh, obviously, that uh, a draft. We're, we stopped kegging virtually everything uh, until uh, um, the bars are ready to open up again, and even our own uh, establishment. So uh, we kind of shifted everything we can to to the larger 15-pack uh, um, stuff. That's what's, that's what's really selling, um, and that's what uh, we're devoting all of our resources to. We've kind of – we had to, like, stagger uh, the, the brew, the production team – uh, into groups, so, so they always work with the same people, and they're um, and and we've reduced their their days at the brewery, um, just safety precautions, and and of course all the other safety things too. But yeah, that's kind of our plan for 15 packs to, as much as we can. Jeremy, can you tell us a little bit about the initiative of working with Long Road Distillers? Yeah, that's been great. So. Um, those guys are, uh, they're a local distillery and they're shut down production as well, but they're, uh, they wanted to start making some hand sanitizer because there's demand for that. Uh, a lot of people asking, there's a need and they, they, you know, they can make, they can make that, uh, that high proof alcohol. Um, so they reached out to some local brewers, uh, because what they can do is take product that we don't need anymore and they can distill the alcohol out of it, regardless of what it is. You know, obviously if they were making their own hooch, they would start with a really high alcohol thing and distill that out. Um, but the fact that, uh, they don't, if they can not have to use their own resources to create that, um, fermentable material and then, uh, and, and the time it takes to do that. So we've been, we're going to have a lot of, a lot of, uh, beer that's going to be out of code, date code by the time uh, we get around to being able to pour it. So rather than putting that down the drain or or whatever, we've been sending um, that beer to them, and they're distilling that down, getting the alcohol out of it, and um, making hand sanitizer. And they're supporting their staff that, that is all uh, out of work and with some of the proceeds, um, you know, keeping their lights on there and making a product that is in demand. So, um, you know, it's been, it's been a great situation for both of us. Uh, Helping each other out and, and helping out the greater good. Yeah, that's amazing. Cool stuff. Which I also think it's fantastic that you guys are, or they're the social media team for founders. Go boy. Um, <laughs> um, they're doing such a great job with highlighting different businesses um, each day on you know Instagram. I think that's completely fabulous to be able to have such good, great community support. I think that's awesome. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, they uh, they do they do a fabulous job. They uh, yeah, like I said, there there's so there's so many things going on around founders um, besides what I what, what I do day to day and, and the way it all just really good family of people with uh with, with creativity and good intentions and, and our marketing is is second to none. It's good stuff. As we continue to navigate our way through these uncertain times, Dracina Wines hopes that you and your loved ones are safe and healthy. We typically would be spending our weekends at events getting to know our new customers, but quarantine means that we are unable to pour our wines for you in person. It is understandable that you may be hesitant to purchase wines that you have not yet tasted, and we get that shipping can add a significant amount to the bottle cost. With this, we have decided to offer $5 shipping on any $120 order. Plus, we have a special six-pack offer 
that will ship three bottles of our 92-point 2017 Classic Cabernet Franc and three bottles of our double gold medal winning 2017 Plummer Vineyard Reserve Cabernet Franc to your door for just $220 plus tax. That is over a $60 saving. Our wines plus your moments equals great memories. And aren't we all in need of some great memories right now? So please head to www.dracinawines.com to place your order and use code EXPLORE to receive an additional 10% off your first order. I think we, we have some questions in the chat, but if anyone wants to jump in and ask questions... Um, Following the chat, so if anybody wants to just okay, read yeah. to me or re-ask him, that's fine. Do, do you find the uh, the old day IPA was really easy drinking? Do you find it you get uh, different um, flavors from a can or a glass bottle or a cap? I, you know, a lot of a lot of the. Um, way you perceive a taste of a beer is due to the, the environment you're in and the environment you're, you're drinking it from. So while the liquid going into there is all exactly the same, drinking from a bottle and drinking from a can seem different to me. And I think that you, uh, it kind of, it can affect your drinking experience, uh, you, even, uh, you know, uh, off draft too. So while the liquid is the same, yeah, I think there is some, 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 some difference there. Now, if you pour your can into a glass and you pour your bottle into a glass, there should be absolutely no difference, but you know, drinking from a bottle and can, how much oxygen is being let in as you as you sip, um, you know, that will have an effect on it. So, um, personally, I don't buy glass much anymore, just because it's heavy, and I can carry a couple fifteen packs, and it weighs a lot less than a case of bottles. So I find myself going to cans a lot, but if I had a preference, I much prefer drinking out of a bottle uh, than a can. Um, I like drinking out of a bottle so much, I almost even like it it's more. It's like the good old days. I mean, it you just, can't beat it. I feel know? like I've got this nice system where I, I, I know how to let the air in and let the beer glug down. It's just a good feeling. <laughs> Here, let me show you. <laughs> like that. Ooh. Wow. Going from Centennial to the Four Giants is quite the uh, upgrade in hop flavor. <laughs> you should check it out. I got a question for you. <clears throat> so, being that you started out with Founders in 2000, and you're, you've been there for you know 20 years, I know you didn't start out as as brewing there. Um, what has been the, the work ethic that stuck with you throughout the whole time, being in the different positions that you were until current? Yeah, um, there is a, so before I was a brewer, I was, uh, I, I was in, uh, in the auto detailing, uh, industry, which means you, you take a dirty ass used car and you try to, and you do everything you can to make it look new. Um, so it, it got very, uh, I became very detail oriented, especially with the cleaning and, um, I think cleanliness is is probably and that and that meticulous attention to detail of, of cleanliness is is something that is really deeply um, in our uh, tradition here and everybody that's worked there we most of our staff has worked there a long time but all the new people they get it pretty quick um, you know we don't if you see something that's out of place you you clean it up you don't leave messes. And you uh, really get in all the corners, all you check everywhere, and our brewery is pretty immaculately clean. Uh, we get that comment all the time from people that tour our place, and and a clean brewery makes um, makes clean beer, makes good beer, and we don't have those kind of problems where, um, I mean, beer is susceptible to infection pretty easily, and if you're not totally on top of your game, you're going to end up with some something going wrong, and then you get a batch Little of beer fun. that's messed up, and man, people. Uh, you know, the discerning customers are not very forgiving about that. They don't want to get burned with their heart. Yeah. In, you know, How do you navigate, you know, some of the sours that you do have in your line, like Rubeus? And do you run those on a completely different line or do you just you run like, you know, all your kettle sours in one month and then disinfect everything or how do you, how do you I don't know how you navigate that. We have uh, uh, we've. 
we've made two really big investments in 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 my tenure, but especially in the last uh, five years or so. And those are in maintenance and in quality. And those are the two areas that I believe have really set us apart at this point. Um, and and the, the the constant uh testing that we do, um, you know, to know the problem, the problem uh, and have that ability to react. Um, it's just, it's a game changer. You know, we don't wait for, uh, you know, to, for it to show up in the package and then you're tasty. You're like, what happened to this? Or worse yet, several months later and you're getting mm-hmm. calls about it. So, um, you know, we, 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 every, uh, everything, we have a microbiologist that, um, studies every, every sample and, and that was a very uh, expensive uh, lesson uh, learned by InBev, wasn't it? Well, I man, think everybody, right. everybody, uh, took, took note of the price tag of what, what does this cost on the back end versus, you know, just running a, a few, you know, quality samples, you know, on the production line and, yeah, you know, prior was, to, to drop shipping. That was my, uh, that's, that's, that's the kind of shit that keeps me up at night, you know, um, one of those kind of problems. So yep. this, uh, the, the investments we made in, in QC, yeah, it's, it's a lot. Is it overkill? Probably sometime, but you know, helps me sleep good at night. So I don't mind. I saw that somebody was drinking kombucha. Um, Jeremy, what are your thoughts on kombucha and some of these other interesting things like CBD? I don't know. I guess as long as it tastes good, I, um, I haven't actually had an alcoholic kombucha. Um, but I kind of like, I kind of like where where they're going with that. I I'm not a, a huge sour guy, like insanely sour stuff. But I do I don't mind a hint of um some of that lactic acid, like like you get in the gozes and then Berliner Weisses and and even kombucha. Um, so I I, I suffer from from, from bad. Did you just say all day hard <laughs> seltzer. <laughs> oh, I didn't say anything. Like that. <laughs> Sound like I said that? You're just fucking. Weird. I think maybe. I think maybe you did. Maybe. <laughs> That's not a bad idea. Though. I'm gonna write that down. Yeah. You know, right here, so I'm just gonna. It, Jeremy, it was a um, kombucha cider that Sebastian made. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's it's blueberry. It's actually quite good. Oh, so, so you know, I can I can get you a can if you want. <laughs> okay, I'm in. <laughs> I wouldn't, uh, actually, I was with them today. I was doing, uh, bottling their hand sanitizers with them today. So. Well, good. Mm-hmm. Yep. These are, uh, these are, these are hard times for brewers. So. Uh, yes, exactly. So. We're going to do what we can. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's why I was excited that you guys were working with, uh, Long Road, or at least that they were taking your product. So that was good. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, yep. uh, it's, 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 it's not easy for them. I mean, obviously we're, we're, we're sending them kegs of lower alcohol beer right. but you know, they're making it work you know, they would probably prefer a tote of something really high alcohol and okay. yeah. Yeah, what else what else you want to talk about so hey, there's there's a lot of brews that we would discuss today that i've never seen um are they specifically shipped to certain areas of the country or is it uh, available direct you're talking about our our portfolio? Yes. Um, I think we at, we currently offer everything everywhere. Um, it's kind of up to the, uh, the, the the wholesaler if they want to bring it in. If 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 the salespeople sell into retail enough volume for the wholesaler to to get it, um, you know. But we we kind of look at we're going to be looking at more in the future. Uh, is is it worth it? Sometimes you know it's. Uh, when you get to a size, a certain volume of like we are, and you have to ter- you have to decide where to put your efforts in, uh, as far as logistically, um, you know, getting beer everywhere. Maybe it's not the most feasible thing to offer everything in your giant portfolio everywhere, but we currently do. So, um, if 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 you don't, if there's something that we have that you haven't seen, there just hasn't been a a, 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 a request for it at the retail level, at least to the point where the wholesaler wants to bring it in. So you got to convince all uh, three tiers to, to make it happen. Well, Kyle, easy there. <laughs> Earlier you had talked about the scaling up and getting the process correct. So as a somebody who worked in the food industry as a microbiologist, 
um, and then dealing with product scale ups. How do you do that in terms of going from your micro scale to 100 barrels? Is that what you're, you know, like it's not a one to one relationship. So how do you figure that out? It's not. It's not. It usually comes with uh, some some trial and error. But our so our pilot system is is a, a thirty barrel system. Oops, what did I just do there? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm back. Uh, a thirty barrel system, and the and the, the biggest brew house is three hundred. So that is a that is a a fairly large jump. And yes, it's it's not a direct. Uh, scale up. There's there's efficiency things to to consider. So it just comes with experience. You kind of get an idea of if you get this on a 30 barrel, you're gonna have to multiply it by this. You'll know your efficiency on on the 300. Now, fortunately, because um, most of the beers on the 300 are going to be uh, uh, all day centennial, maybe some dirty bastard things that we make all the time. Um, so that's pretty dialed in. If it's a seasonal beer or a, a first time specialty beer that we're going to make on the, uh, we'll probably make it on the 80 barrel. The jump from 30 to 80 is not as big, but it's still significant and to the point where we generally will make a batch on the 80, like maybe a week and a half ahead of the other batches. So we can kind of get a feel of, did we hit our numbers right? Is it doing what we think it's going to do? And that gives us time to adjust and, and, and blend. Um, you know, I was... I don't know what it is, if it's just a mental thing, but when I first started like blending batches, I was, I was like opposed to it. I was like, you know, I made this batch of beer. This is the batch of beer. This is how I wanted to taste. And I thought it was, for some reason, I just thought it was weird to, to blend your beer. It's but a very it, different skill. And a lot of brewers don't want to go there. I totally get that comment. I, and, but yeah. And now I'm like, well, it makes perfect sense, and it, it allows us to dial in and make a really consistent product. So, um, so bl- so blending, even if you make the first batch and you didn't quite hit your ABV or your 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 terminal gravity is too low, it finishes thin. Uh, you have subsequent turns to adjust to that, and then the final blend is going to be right where you want it. So, uh, it's nice. To, it's really nice to be able to have that um, capability, the volume that we have. Um, so we rely a lot on that, but. That's kind of how we make that jump. So, Jeremy, um, when you're not drinking Founders, what are you drinking? Hmm. Man, I drink a lot of Founders. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, you know, when I'm traveling around, I like to check out. Um, oh, please say Jen. Please say Jen. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do switch to. I make the switch to liquor usually uh, in a couple hours. Um, <laughs> I like to finish off the night with uh, um, just a little lullaby nightcap. Just something, something <laughs> so besides sweet. beer. I do like uh, one of my one of my favorites. It's so simple, but I just like a little bourbon and lemonade together. I think, I think lemonade is one of the most fabulous mixers that you can make it with. Oh, you bourbon. have to have my daily then. So rum. it's uh, it's rum yeah. and uh, lemon lemon tonic. There you go. There well, you I'm go. Not, yeah, right. that's that's a good daily drink. We we have it. Emma, I don't think I've ever had bourbon and lemonade together. I think I may have to try that tonight. <laughs> that's why I, I highly recommend it. Um, I actually made a you beer. Ever and like that. with uh, doing anything in wine barrels. Um, I've messed around with wine barrels a little bit. Uh, I guess what I found is that it doesn't generally um, you don't the flavor impact is 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 more subtle. Um, I think that wine barrels, um, unless you're putting a more delicate beer in there, um, the, the, the changes you, the, that you pick up from the barrel are going to be a little bit um, more subdued. Uh, wine barrels, generally, people will put sour beer in it because they're not looking for a lot of impression from the barrel. Maybe just a little oakiness. Um, but I've done some beers in wine barrels, and, and, and you try it in six months, and then nine, and then a year, and then like a year and a half, and you're like, man, this is never going to do anything. Well... I'll be the first to say I'd love to see some of the curmudgeon on a on a red wine on a Zinfandel. That's a great I, uh, finish. We, yeah, we I, can I think... we can supply you with Cab Franc barrels if that's what really? you're looking for. Absolutely. <laughs> Interesting enough. Um, I've done some port barrel. I think port is, a, is an aggressive enough uh, liquid that 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 cuts through. But some of the, the lighter wine varieties just. I think unless you put a really delicate beer in there, you'd be hard pressed to really draw much barrel character out of it. I like the idea of rum, Jeremy. 
rum? rum night. Yeah, there was that rum. So who so who had the rum cocktail? The daily was that you, Mike? Yep, it was me. <clears throat> it was featured on our on our rum show. Yeah, that uh, uh, we uh, it's a, a very common you know beverage with rum, which is just rum with uh, lemon tonic. Oh, that like sounds a, very nice. Like a form of daiquiri. It sounds great. Yeah, a little different than a daiquiri. Yeah, uh, but yeah. Uh, still has that citrus hit to it. Yeah, love it. Okay, guys, so we are coming to the close of our awesome happy hour with Jeremy. So if we want to end this with a cheers, I think that's a great way to end it. Thank you so much for joining us. The Red Green Mind team plus Jeremy from Founders Brewing is awesome. <laughs> cheers. Thanks, cheers. Thanks, guys. It was really nice meeting everybody. <laughs> Hope everybody has a great night. Stay safe. Yeah, cheers. Cheers to staying safe. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers to get us through, Jeremy. <laughs> cheers, guys. Hey guys. Cheers. Thank you, everybody. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Cheers. This has been another episode of Exploring the Wine Glass. Thanks for listening. If you have suggestions on what topics you would like me to discuss, please reach out on social media. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook as Exploring the Wine Glass. I'm also on LinkedIn as Lori Hoyt Budd. Of course, you can always email me at exploringthewineglass at gmail.com. If you enjoyed our podcast, please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast catcher to help others find me more easily. Until next week, slancha.